Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, and thank you um, hugely for having invited me uh, to uh, come and open your conference. It's a real, it's a real privilege. Um, as you say, Jenny, I used to be a politician, so actually speaking to this many people at once is uh, both a trip down memory lane and also quite daunting. And uh, people never really believe this about politicians, but we do get nervous making speeches. And uh, I, I get particularly nervous because one of my first speeches after I became elected as an MP was after we had just increased the pension by about 75p a week, and um, we were in a terrible place with pensioners. And one of the first invites I got was to go and speak to a group of uh, pensioners for a, a lobby group called Age Concern. Uh, and there was actually an older, more experienced MP there, uh, and he said, don't worry, I'll go first, I'll get them back on side. I said, okay, fine, that's no, no problem, you, you, you go first. And so he, he got up and he started making this real tub-thumping speech, uh, and then he was just getting to the meat of his speech when he said that he knew this issue of pensions was really important to them, uh, this group of pensioners, because, because they didn't have very much time left. <laughs> and, uh, I learned my first lesson in politics, which is, don't tell your audience they're about to die. It doesn't go down very well. <laughs> By the way, what's going on with you and the royal wedding? The, the funny thing is everyone in England has sort of left the country because there's been so many bank holidays. Whereas here, and I thought, here, come, come to Australia and there'd be a good Republican disdain for what was going on. And actually, everybody last night was completely glued to the, uh, to the television. It was extraordinary. Um, Although, actually, um, uh, I, I quite like the Queen in, in one way, which is um, we were once in a meeting with a uh, Privy Council meeting in which Claire, Short, um, uh, Claire Short's phone went off. And we all know what that's like. Your phone goes off, you reach down, and you turn it off. Except Claire Short decided to reach into her handbag and picked it up, saw who it was, uh, put it to her ear, and said, sorry, I'm in a meet. Right, OK. Yeah, 4.30? Yeah, fine, OK. I'll see you later. Bye. And the queen paused and looked at her and said, well, I trust that wasn't anyone too important, Miss Short. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the title I was given was um, Renewing Our Progressive Values. And I guess, I guess that comes out of a similar debate which is happening here and in the UK, which is around the idea of a, uh, of a progressive paradox. Uh, am I speaking to the wrong bit of the microphone? No. Uh, about, around how progressive parties face a paradox. And the paradox goes something, something like this. Um, after the great financial crisis, we all said that there was going to be a great progressive moment. Uh, we were the market failure people that had been a terrible market failure. Surely now we would be able to persuade people to be social democrats. But in Europe, certainly, it didn't happen. There are now scarily fewer center-left parties in power in Europe than at any point since the First World War. So, so far, that's pretty well known. But actually, having this meeting here in Australia gives that progressive paradox a further twist, which is that even when we don't go into recession, still we can't win. An observer who'd arrived from outer space last year uh, in August uh, 21st would have thought that you deserved a landslide for the amazing uh, efforts of your government in keeping the country out of recession and in creating the stimulus. And yet you just squeaked home. Uh, in Chile, the socialists similarly kept their country out of recession and managed to have their stimulus funded entirely through the sovereign wealth fund which they'd built up in good times. And yet despite that, in Chile, the right won for the first time since Pinochet. So the paradox is that when the economy goes down, progressives lose. But when the economy doesn't crash, progressives still can't win. Now, at this moment of the argument, we tend to go for what I call the gratitude game. It goes something like this. Why aren't our voters more grateful for all the wonderful things that we've done for them? Tony Blair, at this point, used to segue into what um, we in his office used to call the, his Monty Python skit. And it went something, you know the Monty Python bit where he's talking about the Judeans complaining about the Romans having never done anything for them except the aqueduct and the education system and the, yeah. Exactly, so Blair's list would have been, uh, and it's pretty similar to your list actually, but Blair's list would have been the minimum wage, 
the shortest waiting times in history, crime down by a third, short start, record results in schools, devolution, civil partnerships for gay couples, peace in Northern Ireland, four weeks paid leave, half a million children out of poverty, maternity pay, paternity leave, child benefit at record levels, the ban on cluster bombs, the cancelling of debt, the trebling of aid, you get the point. And yet still our Judeans weren't grateful. And that is the cause of our progressive paradox. And so what I want to try and argue today is actually the way that we get out of that paradox is actually not by renewing our progressive values, but by returning to our labor tradition. I want to argue that it is the labor tradition that is a better guide to reorganizing and rethinking and then winning again. So I'm not an expert on your politics and I won't pretend to be, and instead I want to focus on uh, the UK and what the lessons of the last election were. I'm really looking forward to finding out much more about your politics and to seeing what the similarities and differences are. But to start with the UK, we have to start from a very simple point, which is that it was a catastrophic defeat for Labour. It was the worst decline in the Labour vote since the Second World War. The previous worst was that in 1979, we had a 2.4% drop compared to 1974. So in one election cycle, we'd lost 2.5% of our vote. This time, we managed to mislay 6.5% of our vote, so it's more than twice as bad as the last time. Now, how do we do that? Well, to understand why, I think the best place to start is the last election. And two images dominate my memory of that election. The first was the third debate. Gordon Brown had just had his worst 24 hours in politics. Um, he just called Mrs. Duffy a bigot. I think that was as big news here as it was. Yeah, okay. So it's not just royal weddings that you like. Uh. <laughs> um, now, what you might not have seen was the third debate afterwards. And actually, Gordon, despite having uh, done that, did remarkably well. He was a pretty tough stone so um, even I have to admit. If you put himself in his shoes, uh, you can imagine it would be just about any politician's worst nightmare. You've just been judged to have lost the first two debates. Your party is polling below the Lib Dems and looks like it's going to come third for the first time <laughs> since 1918. Immigration is the biggest issue in voters' minds, and yet you've just called a lifelong Labour voter a bigot behind her back for raising that issue with you. And now you've got to go on TV and defend yourself. And as I say, he did do rather well, but that um, performance was woven around a negative. Gone was any pretense at defending Labour's record or offering an alternative. Our message was very simple. Our message was that the Tories were a risk that people couldn't afford to take. Labour at the last election ran a fearful campaign in pretty much every sense of the word. And that's sort of the conventional explanation for why Labour lost at the last election, that we'd lost the courage both to defend our record, but also the courage to reform and therefore offer people a new alternative. And that is a large part of the truth. It's, it's sort of what people on my side of the party back at home would say was the main reason why we lost, that we'd lost the courage to reform. And yet, actually, I think there's a much deeper reason why we lost. And that reason, I, to, to get to that, I think we need to go actually slightly earlier the previous day to before the bigot moment, to actually what Mrs. Duffy was saying to Gordon, which caused him to be so angry. And so to quote Mrs. Duffy, what she said was, look, the three main things that I had drummed in when I was a child was education, health service, and looking after people who are vulnerable. There are too many people who aren't vulnerable but they can claim, and people who are vulnerable can't get to claim. And actually, the rest of her exchange is just as instructive. She says that local schools are good. She says, she says she's hoping that her kids will get to go, her grandchildren will get to go to university, and she's worried that she has to pay tax on her widow's pension. Mrs. Duffy actually sums up all the reasons why we had to create new labor, that we had to be for aspiration, that we had to be for good public behavior, that we had to be for good public services and have a concern for the most vulnerable. In what she said to the Prime Minister before uh, the sort of culmination of it, she actually recognized that pretty much all of those things that she had asked for had been delivered on, that basically our promises had been met. 
And yet she was still angry enough to upbraid the Prime Minister for 10 minutes live on national TV. Why was she so angry? Well, this is where I'd like to introduce what I think is the most interesting bit of the debate in Britain, the debate between Blue Labour and New Labour. Blue Labour is a term which was coined by Morris Glassman, who's an academic who's been made a peer by Ed Miliband. Morris argues that Mrs. Duffy and millions like her had good reason to be angry, that it wasn't her gratitude problem, it was our attitude problem. It was, in short, that we had become progressive rather than labor. 